Hey booktube, this is Kelly. Thank you so much for joining me in another Shaketember video. This being the month where we celebrate all things Shakespeare. Um, I am hosting the event this year along with my husband Jason from Old Blues Chapter and Verse and Nicole at A Day of Small Things. And I just wanted to talk to you guys about are Shakespeare's pl history plays actually history. No, they're not history. Now, we also, um, the three of us came up with a, a great tag called the Shakespeare Journey Tag. If you haven't done it, definitely encourage you and welcome you to do that whenever. It doesn't have to be this month. But um, one of the questions in that tag is, do any of Shakespeare's plays intimidate you? And of the ones I've seen so far, people either say, all of Shakespeare's plays intimidate them, none of Shakespeare's plays intimidate them, or the history plays intimidate them. And I once felt the same way. I was intimidated by the history plays. What do I know about British history? Which, full disclosure, not anywhere near as much as I should, but I, there's so much British history. Where do you even start? Stonehenge, right? Um, but uh, we had this copy of Richard II, Henry IV, part one and part two, and Henry V, which has since become my second favorite Shakespeare play. So I really enjoyed these. Um, I, I think I buddy read a couple of these um, with another booktuber and yeah, I really got a lot out of them. So, so that made me feel a little more confident. One of the things that caught my attention when I read um, Henry IV part one is there's this, this battle scene and there's Prince Hal who's going to go on to become Henry V um, and he's fighting Hotspur and if you're like me and you like notes and you like reading the notes um, in Shakespeare plays, um, there was a note about this age difference between Hotspur and Prince Hal. Um, these two guys who are, they both seem like they're in their 20s, or like they seem young. The note was that there was absolutely no way the two of them would have ever been in a battle because the age difference between them was too great. And I looked it up today, and again, this could be wrong, but one place I saw said that the age difference between Hotspur and Prince Hal was 23 years. That Hotspur was actually older than Henry IV, Prince Hal's father. So that's a big difference. Now, the real question, the real tricky question is, did Shakespeare know that? Because we don't always know what Shakespeare knew, and when he was doing something for dramatic purposes. With Henry IV, I definitely feel like Shakespeare wanted it to be two young men battling each other, and it was for, it, it's, it's a play, it's for a theatrical effect. So let's talk about when Shakespeare lived and the time that he lived in first, just really briefly. So Shakespeare, we think, lived from 1564 to 1616. Um, most of his life, Queen Elizabeth I was the ruler of England and she um, was queen from 1558 to 1603. Now, Queen Elizabeth was a tutor. She was the daughter of Henry VIII. Henry VIII is the son of Henry VII, so we're gonna get there. <laughs> but, but I find it really interesting that um, Shakespeare wrote a play about Henry VIII, and the first, uh, one of the first recorded performances of it was in 1613. So he waited a decade until after Elizabeth, um, Queen Elizabeth's death to write that play and have it be performed. He waited an, 
he waited 10 years um, to tell that story. He was no fool. Now we get to Richard III, who fought against Henry VII in the Battle of Bosworth, and Richard III... Richard III loses. Okay, so Richard III lived from 1452 to 1485, and he was king of England from 1483 to 1485. Don't necessarily know what did Shakespeare know about the real Richard III. Um, one of the references, again, if you're like me and you look at notes a lot that you'll see is um, a document called Hollingshed's Chronicles, which was a collaborative work. It was multiple volumes. Um, and it's, it's the history of England, Ireland, Scotland. Um, and so lots of times in the notes, there will be a reference to Hollingshed. It was first published in 1577. So again, remember, we think Shakespeare was born in 1564. So he definitely would have had access to Hollingshed's Chronicles. Now, in Richard III, I've already talked a little bit in my own kind of review video, if you will, <laughs> of, of Richard III, and I'll link to that down below. But um, one of the characters, Queen Margaret of Anjou, um, she's in the play, but she died a year before uh, Richard III became king, and she was living in France at the time. So she wasn't even in England. But again, I don't know if Shakespeare knew that about her, and again, I don't think it, I don't really care because she's fantastic. Um, and the play, it's just, her speeches are incredible. The play starts that um, Richard's older brother, King Edward IV, um, is ruling England and he has a lot of heirs. So even if Richard had killed the two boys in the tower, which we're gonna talk, I'm gonna mention it again here in a little bit. So even if Richard had killed Edward's two young sons, he had a lot of other children. And there's even question about whether those children were legitimate. Were they really legitimate heirs um, to the throne? Um, the tower where the princes were, you know, allegedly staying in the play, in the play, they're in the tower. Um, it was a royal residence. We have a very dark view of, of the tower nowadays, but, um, yeah, it was a royal, it was, it was a, it was a royal residence. So it wasn't, it wasn't a prison. <laughs> One of the books in my family, and I know this is a novel, right? This is a novel, so we have to keep that in mind. But one of my family's favorite books is called The Daughter of Time by Josephine Tay, which was published in 1951. Josephine Tay um, was a, a mystery writer um, and uh, just incredible. This is part of her Detective Alan Grant series. There's another one in this series called To Love and Be Wise, which I also highly recommend. It was so beloved in my family. My grandmother literally kept two copies of this book as well as two copies of 84 Charing Cross Road in case she met someone who hadn't read them, she would give them a copy of the book go and buy another one for the next person that she met who had read The Daughter of Time. The Daughter of Time features, again, Detective Alan Grant. He is recovering uh, from an injury and he is laid up in, in bed in the hospital. Like he can hardly, can hardly do anything. He's just laying flat on the bed. And there's all these books next to him that people have brought him to read. He's not interested in that. And one of his lady friends um, brings him a bunch of prints from uh, the portrait the portrait gallery. Um, she buys buys a whole bunch of different 
different portraits of people's, you know, people throughout time, their faces, because as a detective, Alan Grant is really interested in a face. And one of those faces is Richard III. And so he starts asking people, what do you think about this person? Just without telling them that it's Richard III. Um, and his doctor thinks like, oh, he looks like he had polio maybe. So that was interesting. Um, but they all have these very different impressions of him than, than Shakespeare's version. So uh, eventually he um, finds somebody, a, an American student who is, I don't know if he's interning or what exactly, but he's, he's doing research at the British Museum. And so the two of them together dive into the story of Richard III, the real Richard III, and, and because the American student has access to the British Museum, you know, is working in the British Museum or doing research in the British Museum, he has access to a ton of documents. And again, so they start with looking at Hollingshed's Chronicles. Well, where did, where did those people get their sources? Hollingshed book got some of its information about Richard III from Sir Thomas More. And where did he get his information from John Morton? He was Henry VII's Archbishop of Canterbury and Richard's bitterest enemy. Um, so, so the trail of how people are writing the history of Richard III um, is, coming, is coming from some very questionable sources, okay? <laughs> to say nothing of the least. The other thing that I just, I, I, to me, this is the most persuasive evidence that Richard III did not kill his nephews in the tower or have, have his nephews killed. So Henry VII, when he takes, takes the crown um, after defeating Richard at Bosworth, and Richard dies, of course, in battle, um, Henry VII brings what's called a Bill of Attainer before Parliament. And he, he slanders Richard III in this Bill of Attainer, but he does not say anything about Richard having his nephews killed. Um, and I just, I'll just briefly share just a little bit um, uh, from one of the characters what they Nothing say. Nothing will fit the facts except for the conclusion that the boys were alive when Henry took over the tower. It was com um, it was com a completely unscrupulous act of attainer. It accused Richard's followers, the loyal followers of an anointed king fighting against an evader of treason. Every accusation that Henry could possibly make with any hope of getting away with it was t was <laughs> with getting away with it was put into the bill. And the very worst he could accuse Richard of was the usual cruelty and tyranny. The boys aren't even mentioned. I think Josephine Tay would have been a member of the Richard III Society if that had been around at the time. Another thing that I have found interesting in, in reading about this is um, uh, just some notes in uh, in this library copy of Richard III. And this is um, Richard III Shakespeare in performance. So it's almost like a copy for an actor um, to read and study. Um, and it, it mentions the Richard III Society at the beginning of the book. Um, it says is, um, they're devoted to rehabilitating Richard's reputation um, and done, cons it's, um, Shakespeare has done considerable damage, its members point out, by his fictional misrepresentation. Um, and at the back of it is um, actually one of the um, actors, uh, I I'm, hope I'm pr pronouncing his name right, Anthony Cher. Um, he played Richard III for the Royal Shakespeare Company he used um, crutches on his arms like that had braces, so his hands were still free, but he, he used crutches to get, around, um, to get around the stage. 
And he was talking about him, how intimidating it was to play this role that was so famous um, from Laurence Olivier. And so he he decides, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to go to the real Richard. I'm going to look at the historical record. And then he says, no, wrong, dead end. The real king bears no relation to Shakespeare's version as letters from the Richard III Society will continue to remind me long into my performance as Richard III. Um, and there's a quote here. So someone wrote to him, you are yet another actor to ignore truth and integrity in order to launch yourself on an ego trip enabled by the monstrous lie perpetrated by Shakespeare about a most valiant, honorable, and excelling king. <laughs> so so the actors even kind of get, get beat up a little bit <laughs> by playing Richard III. Which leads me to the final thing I just wanted to share with you. And again, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a movie. Um, and this is such a great movie. I love this. This is The Lost King, um, starring Sally Hawkins. Steve Coogan is also in it. But um, Sally Hawkins plays, I believe it's now Dame Philippa Langley. But she was the person who started the the real like I mean she raised money who got the permits all this this kind of all these hoops to jump through to try to find Richard the Third's body the movie definitely you can see Sally Hawkins who's just brilliant talking to <laughs> talking to Richard the Third but she um it starts off and again, this is fictional. I don't think this is how it really happened. I think Philippa Langley actually read a book about Richard III, and that's what propelled her on her journey. But in the film, Sally Hawkins goes to see a performance with uh, her son uh, of Richard III. And at intermission, they're talking with some of the parents and students, and she says, I... I just have a hard time because Philippa Langley does have a disability. Um, it's called ME, which stands for something. I know it has to do with like chronic fatigue and some other things, but she says, I find it hard to believe that someone with a disability could just be so cruel. Um, but it's the play in the film anyway. It's the play that really gets her mind churning to find out the truth. In 2012, they find his body and you can see pictures of the excavation online. If I can, I will try to leave some links down below. Um, but I wanna read something by Philippa Langley now for sure um, because I think it's just a really incredible story. But I think, you know, again, are Shakespeare's history plays history? No, they are a play and I don't think there's anything, I, I would never dream of writing a letter to someone who's portraying a character in a history play that it's wrong of them to do so. Shakespeare was writing for entertainment. Um, and I think he felt he had the ability to be a little loose with history, to to rearrange things a little bit or um, to make two characters fight each other who would have never fought each other in battle. Because I think that, um, I think his audience may have known some of that. They may have said, oh, okay, he's like taking some liberties here, like with this. I don't think they would have gone after him for that. They, they wanted to be entertained. Finally, and this is maybe the most important thing is that history is written by the conquerors. So even if Shakespeare had somehow known that Richard III like wasn't this, wasn't as evil as his play portrays, he would have never done that. He would have never had that, he would have never told that story of Richard III while Elizabeth I is queen, right? I, it's basically the hero, the hero of Richard III is Elizabeth I's grandfather. So he was too smart. He would have never, ever had a play that would have 
really ticked off the queen and that sort of thing. I just don't think he would have done that because I think he was just too clever. So anyway, I have gone on too long, but I would love to know what you think about Shakespeare's history plays. How do you feel about him? If he was actually like being a little freer with history, does that bother you or not? Uh, please let me know uh, in the comments section down below. And booktube, thank you so much for watching. Remember to be kind to yourself, be kind to others, and I'll be back soon with another video. Bye.